Hi, it's Dr. Lori, and I'm here with Thrifting News. Did you hear about these stories? Today we're going to talk about new eBay policies and Chinese valuables found in a kitchen and that Goodwill find, that artifact that's found at Goodwill. Let's get to it eBay has instituted some new policies. Their new policies relate to jewelry. We all know how much everybody loves jewelry. Um, distinguishing between fine jewelry and fashion jewelry. A couple things are, I think are going to happen as a result of these new policies. You know, people are concerned. They want to make sure that they get correct identification of pieces. However, there's going to be some problems I think are going to arise. Some of them can be easily solved if you're more important than ever getting presidium gemstone testers testing these, these particular items. Here's what's happening. Fine jewelry has to be identified, right? And it has to be characterized and listed in a certain way. That includes metals and gemstones. Fashion jewelry is going to be other things that are not considered fine jewelry. So what I think is going to happen is a lot of people who don't know whether they have a lab created stone or whether they have a colored or enhanced stone or whether or not they have precious metals that are being used in their piece of jewelry that they're trying to list and sell. They don't know this. They in fact are going to be up against the situation of where do I list and how do I list it? Do I list it as fine jewelry? If you can't list it as fine jewelry, they're going to, a lot of these pieces are going to end up listed as fashion jewelry. And I think there are going to be a lot of bargains out there from those folks who make a mistake or don't know what they've got. It's going to make of course, identification, I say identification is important all the time, identification more important than ever now if you're going to be listing fine or fashion jewelry on eBay. So you're going to have to actually know these things. A lot of people are getting concerned about not knowing, you know, not having the, um, the information, the documentation for a lot of these precious stones, gemstones and such. However, it's going to be important that you get the tools of the trade, the diamond testers, the gemstone testers and such, so you can at least have, again, that uh, definitive information when you list your piece, when you categorize or identify your pieces. So this is a big policy change, and I think it's going to make an impact. For some, they're saying, oh, it's going to be a big problem. It's going to be very difficult for resellers. For others, they're going to see some opportunities for bargains. So then there's this story about the 18th century Chinese vase that was found in a kitchen and it sold for $1.8 million at an English auction house. Well, that's great for the person who was in that kitchen with that Chinese vase, but people want to know why. They want to know why a couple of whys. First of all, why is it important? Well, what's important about it has to do with how it's made. The, art is, the artistry of this vase is important. Um, gill, it's, it's gold, it's silver, it's blue. It has these cranes on it. And these cranes are important because of when it was made. It was made during the Queen Long Emperor's reign um, in the 18th century or the 1700s. And it was made in a, it was made, of course, fired in a kiln. And the way they were able to manipulate and make this piece within the kiln is very, very unusual and very important. Now, as I said, you know, the 18th century is not all that, you know, all that old for China. You know, there's a lot of things that happened prior to the 18th century in China that are innovative and important. This piece is important for a couple of reasons. The Queen Long Emperor was a Taoist. So he was interested, of course, in Taoism. And those cranes on that vase represent Taoism. So anytime a work of art relates to culture or history, you see value go up and you see, of course, interest go up. That's why it's worth so much. The question here might be about the auction estimate. And the auction estimate for that particular piece was $186,000 when it sold for about 10 times that amount at $1.8 million. Why is it that a lot of these auction estimates are about 10% of what they sell for? You would think that the auction houses can get closer to what it's going to sell for. Well, there are a couple of times that this happens. This also happened with a 16th century Majolica plate that was sold at auction, which was estimated at about 10% of the value that it sold for. That plate had Samson and Delilah on it. And that particular Majolica plate is earthenware ceramic with that lead glaze. I've talked to you about Majolica many times, and I've appraised a lot of Majolica. Many of you have found Majolica. I remember um, people finding Majolica pieces in their thrifting, you know, and talking about it too. So, so 
in terms of it, I want you to think about that when you're looking at these. A lot of, a lot of auction houses may use those lower number estimates so they can say, look, we sold the piece for 10 times what the estimate was. What a wonderful auction, how exciting it was to get this. They, you know, a million dollars for a piece like that is not unheard of for the 18th century Chinese Quin Long marked. It was marked with the Qin Long mark, um, with the Quin Long mark. So, you know, that's not uncommon for those types of pieces. But I want you to be aware of what's going on. It's kind of exciting, of course, something found in a kitchen, but good stuff is found all the time. It's found all the time, all over the place. And the global secondhand market is poised to be worth $218 billion by 2026. You know, that means specifically all kinds of things that are resold, all kinds of things that relate to the reselling or thrifting sector are going to go up that high. But 127% growth is what's projected for vintage clothing and antique clothing specifically. That also means accessories, that also means shoes, that also means purses, that means wallets, change purses, sunglasses, eyeglasses, wristwatches, the whole deal. So you're going to see all that. Anything on your person is going to go up. Now, that's also probably going to help out the general and entire um, resale market, antique, vintage, thrifting market. And the reason why I mentioned that, in my opinion, if you're in that store and you're looking at some vintage, you know, I don't know, 1960s era Campbell Soup Andy Warhol dress, or you're looking at some, um, you know, Laura Ashley party dress with the big sleeves kind of thing, or the dropped waist pieces that, you know, were being worn in the 80s too, you know what, those pieces are going to be valuable and if you're there looking for those pieces in that same way, you're going to be in that one of those stores. You're probably going to go look at a vintage board game. You're probably going to look at a vintage cookie jar. You might pick up vintage, you know, hats or whatever other types of pieces, pottery and such. So all of it is going to go, all boats rise with the tide, right? So all ships rise with the tide. So if one's going up, it's all probably going to go up. You're going to see that. It's kind of the way when you're in a grocery store and, you know, you go in for just milk. You're just getting there for milk. You're getting in and out. You're going for milk. You come out, you bought, you know, chicken and you said, oh, well, I'll get some cheese and crackers and oh, well, you know, while I'm here, I pick up some cabbage cheese and, and you know, a yogurt or whatever the heck it is. You end up with a big pile of, you know, groceries when you expected to just go in and get milk. Um, but hmm, sounds like I eat a lot of dairy, I guess. <laughs> but, but basically, that's what you want to think about when you're looking at this. So there's a big opportunity here for reselling. So you want to think about that op that opportunity in clothing specifically a lot of you know this a lot of people are doing this a lot of people are just happy when they say oh i remember i had that perry ellis shirt when i was a kid or oh i loved those those nike sneakers they were wonderful you know and i liked those but you're going to see a big increase and in the united states it's projected that w by 2026 it will go to about 82 billion billion with a b dollars um, in this particular economic sector. So that, that's a lot of money. That's a, a big, big movement up. So that's going to help everybody who loves art, antiques, collectibles, vintage. So you might have heard about this Roman portrait bust that was found at a Goodwill for $34 or so. And uh, it's now going to be sent back to the German authorities and to German museums. You know, a lot of good stuff is found at Goodwill. And I've been showing you that for a long, long time. And this particular piece is important for a couple of reasons. People are asking, you know, why is it important? Well, it's important for a couple of reasons. Uh, the fact that it is um, very typical of the style of early first century AD uh, portraiture, uh, where every single like mole and every single eyebrow out of place and every single, you know, uh, physical trait is identified. It's really, really, really high quality, very realistic. And that was something of the Romans. The other thing about this is that it was part of the um, monarch's collection. So it was part of the royal collection in Germany. And it was, of course, um, a piece that came out of Germany as a result of World War II. So some particular area was bombed. This piece was in that place, probably a palace or such. And then that piece was, of course, in some way got itself to the United States and then ends up getting to goodwill. This stuff happens all the time. I've appraised pieces, Roman portraits, um, busts like this at my events, and they typically have some significant value. They could be somewhere in the $25,000 to $250,000 range, depending on who the figure is. So that's what a lot of conversation about who's the figure, who's the figure. Um, 
But in terms of what's happening to it, it usually has to go to what's called an intermediary museum because the piece has to be given back because technically, even though the woman went into Goodwill and paid $34.99 for it, it doesn't belong to her because it was stolen. So technically it was stolen and now it has to be sent back to the original owner. So um, she doesn't get to have rights of ownership on it. And the museum's gonna get involved to hold it and take care of it until it can go back and get all the paperwork and all of the stuff, all, everything in line so it can go back to the original German museum authorities. But in terms of it, it doesn't surprise me at all that you have a piece that shows up like that in any of these thrift stores or any of these donation centers. Um, a lot of people would just say, I don't know what it is and how could it possibly be real so it then ends up there. But this is a typical example and one that a lot of people should take note of when you're in these places, you know, more and more you're going to start finding these pieces. This piece also has significant interest because it's connection to World War II and looted items. There are a lot of pieces that were lost for a long time. There are pieces, you know, when I was in Belgium, for example, there was a piece I wanted to see very badly. It's called the Bruges, the Belgian Bruges uh, Michelangelo, the Bruges Madonna. It's the Madonna and Child um, by Michelangelo and it was lost for a long long time during World War II and then it was you know re or found again and now is in a church slash museum in Bruges Belgium you know and people make pilgrimages to go see these pieces because they're pieces that were lost that they thought they'd never see again so it's a big deal to find them again I'm Dr. Lori the opinions expressed here are my own this is thrifting news thanks for being with me I'll see you next time